Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, everybody, I think we can get started. It is my pleasure today to introduce Kay Connolly from Indiana University, my alma mater, so it's, it's a real pleasure for me. I don't know a lot about Kay's work. I'm really looking forward to hearing about it, um, but she works in the area of pervasive health in the computer science department within the School of Informatics, and I'm involved with the advisory board for the School of Informatics, so somehow our, our lines got crossed and we were lucky enough to invite her over uh, for a talk. So enjoy and take it away, Kay. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to talk to about today is an emerging area that's really come about in the last five years or so. Um, I, I think if you look like seven years ago, people started having these workshops at CHI and at UBCOMP all about uh, technology in, in the healthcare arena. And two years ago, we had the first International Pervasive Technologies for Healthcare conference. And as you would expect for a first time conference, you know, the accept rate wasn't something we were really proud of in publishing. But we had it again this last year, and the accept rate went down to 30%. We had so many submissions. And so I think it's really a field that's kind of emerging in its own right. And, um, and uh, I, I've been working in it for about five years now. Um, one of the things that I've noticed when we see a lot of presentations at, at the conferences in this area is a lot of people are very much technical people. They're really interested in sensor networks and, and putting in systems into hospitals and things like that. And they don't have a very strong design background. And they, um, a lot of times they will design applications without ever talking to potential users. And so the message I'm kind of bringing out today is, is something that we're doing at Indiana University. And that's having a very human-centered or user-centered approach to designing these technologies. And some of you, if you're in the HCI field, this is going to be very familiar to you. Um, but I just want to really try to get that out to everyone who's involved in the, in the pervasive technologies for health community. So, um, so that's going to be the focus. So I actually started out in pervasive computing, uh, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. And I was looking at a lot of different applications. And I've slowly kind of gotten more and more involved in healthcare because of the potential impact that it has. I think that people, um, you know, they, they have a hard time uh, enjoying the rest of their lives if their health is, health is at risk or is suffering. And so I have really um, enjoyed uh, working with people to help them maintain and improve their own health. So just to give you a little bit of context um, in, into why this is an emerging area, I think a lot of our current health infrastructure in the United States as well as other uh, first world countries are really becoming overloaded because we have a couple of significant trends that are going on. Uh, the first one is that our medical care is really good. And so diseases that used to be terminal are now becoming chronic diseases. And people are living 20, 30 or more years with diseases such as cancer and AIDS. Um, and, and they require significant medical attention. And so we're having to spend a lot of our resources managing these chronic diseases. Uh, the other thing is a demographic change, and it has to do with the baby boomers basically coming up to retirement age and, and, and starting to experience all the, the issues that you have when you're aging, um, and people are just living a lot longer. And so they're overloading those specific resources that are targeting elders as well. Uh, another thing, though, that is happening because I think uh, a good part of it is because uh, people don't have the kind of time to spend with their doctors that they used to back in my grandmother's day, is that people are becoming a lot more proactive about their health care. You know, they can't rely on being able to spend 30 minutes with a doctor and have him lay or her lay everything out about their disease. And so they're doing a lot of going online, looking for resources, asking other people, and trying to, to be proactive in managing their own health. And this is changing the roles that doctors and patients are playing. And this is really opening up, I think, a lot of opportunities in terms of giving technology to people to help them manage their own health, as opposed to just putting technology in the medical facilities. Um, so, so we have a lot of opportunities here to support these health-related behaviors, and that's what I'm particularly interested in. So what I'm going to do is talk about kind of the approach we take at Indiana University, this human-centered approach. And I'm going to illustrate some of the big themes with three projects that are, that are uh, going on right now. And then at the very end, just a couple of slides, I'm going to kind of announce a new initiative that's going on at IU. 
So the first big theme is having a very user-centered iterative design process. So, um, you know, obviously when you're, when you're looking at the new problem domain, you want to consult the literature, you want to consult experts, they have a wealth of knowledge that you need to use, but you shouldn't just rely on the experts. You need to, I think, really verify a lot of the ingrained assumptions and actually interact with your target population. Um, we also use a very iterative design process in that you don't want to kind of come up with this great design, build, spend a lot of resources building it, and then say, oh, and deploy it and, and discover that some of your assumptions were wrong or something, something wasn't working right. So you want to obtain uh, feedback from your users very early and often and incorporate that feedback into the design. So I'm going to illustrate kind of this process with an application that we are looking at, that we're developing to help a very, very sick population manage an incredibly strict diet. So I chose this quote because it really illustrates kind of how hard it is for this particular population to live with their disease. They, th their whole life is centered around their disease and, and trying to manage their diet and, and they're very exhausted by it. And it's something that you have to think about when you're designing for that population. So the population are hemodialysis pa patients. Um, I'll, I'll call them dialysis patients from now on. But basically, the idea is these patients have lost all use of their kidneys. Um, they don't function anymore. And without a transplant, their lifespan is probably three to five years because of all of the complications that arise when you don't have use of your kidneys. So essentially what happens is once every 48 hours, they have to go into a dialysis unit and they undergo hemodialysis where they're hooked up to this machine that you see on the right hand side of the picture and it acts as their kidneys. The blood is slowly removed from their body. It uh, filters out excess fluid and excess nutrients and then it's put back into their body. And this process takes about four to six hours to do and it is very uncomfortable. By the end of it, they are cramping and they're really pretty miserable, they're dehydrated, and their entire lives are really revolved around this. You know, every two days they have to go in and do this so they can't have a job often, um, and they have to really think about, you know, how much they're consuming, and it just really exhausts them. So you can imagine if you only have use of your kidneys once every 48 hours, what kind of a diet, dietary restrictions you're going to have. I mean, imagine you could only urinate once every 48 hours. That's essentially what you're talking about. So you have very strict limits on the amount of water you're allowed to drink, as well as a whole host of other nutrients, including sodium, potassium, phosphorus. And it's really complicated to try to manage this. As it turns out, 80% of the patients simply can't adhere to this diet, even if they're motivated to adhere to it because it's such a complicated diet. One, of the, one study has shown that up to a third of the patients cannot uh, perform the calculations to go from a nutrition label to what their doctors are telling them they can eat. They just don't have the mathematical uh, capabilities or skills to do that. And so that, of course, makes it even harder. And our particular target population that we're looking at at IU is an urban population that has low literacy rates. Some of these patients can't even read. Um, so traditionally, what the, the kind of care that they're given is they're try, the, the, they meet with dietitians and they try to review what they're eating and help them you know, avoid certain foods. And to do that, they're told to keep paper diaries, you know, write down everything that you're eating. But the compliance rate for these kinds of diaries are as low as 11%. It's really difficult to remember to write down every single thing that you put in your mouth. Um, and this, this is even for motivated people. Um, and in our particular population, since some of them can't read, when they're told to keep a diary of what they're eating, they try to draw sketches of the food that they're eating. And you can imagine how complicated uh, and time intensive that is. Um, in another population with a breast cancer population, 94% of the patients were actually able to comply when they had electronic diaries. So we had a, the nurse researchers who work with this patient population come to us and they were looking for a technical solution. And um, you know, we brainstormed with them and we came up with this idea, which we call the Dietary Intake Monitoring Application, or DEMA. And the idea is we wanted to give them an electronic diary. It could do the conversions that were necessary. It could give them real-time feedback instead of waiting until they met with a dietitian. And maybe it could have a, a, a significant impact on their, their dietary habits. Um, we, we wanted the device to be portable because you don't always eat at home. So we wanted something that you could have at home, but you could also have at a restaurant or if you go to a friend's house. 
And we needed to figure out a very easy way to input what they're eating. Obviously, if they can't read, they're not going to sit there and type in that they're having you know, Cheetos or something like that. So we, we chose two input mechanisms. The first one was a barcode scanner, because most you know, packaged foods have barcodes. And we had access to a database that linked the barcodes to the nutritional information. And, and the second one, if something doesn't have a barcode, perhaps you're eating fresh fruit or you're eating something that you prepared at home, you, we'd have some sort of an icon interface. We didn't know what this would look like at the time, but that was the idea. And then we would always provide feedback. They could always look and say, where am I and how much I'm allowed to drink or the amount of sodium or phosphorus or whatever it is that, the, that they're consuming. And, and we hoped that by having real-time feedback, they'd be able to make choices in real time instead of waiting until they review it with a dietitian and, and then make plans to alter their diet. So to do this, because we were working with a pretty vulnerable population, uh, one that often isn't designed for, low literacy population. We had a very intense iterative design process. And we actually started this project back in 2005. It's before we had funding from the NIH. It's picked up speed quite a, quite a bit since we've gotten funding. But the very first study we did was, can they even use PDAs? Um, this particular population, their physical health is much older than they are in reality. They, they compare more to elders. They have vision problems. They have dexterity problems and coordination problems that are all a result of their particular disease. Um, and so we needed to see if they could actually use the PDAs. Could they see icons on them? Could they press the buttons? Could they use a barcode scanner? Could they do voice recording? Things like that. And, and what we found is that they could actually use these devices but things like for the size of the icons, we couldn't use even the largest default icon size that came in most of the programming packages. We had to customize them so they would be large enough for them to see. And actually, we can, the icons that we're using and the device we're using, we can fit three icons in a row, and that's as much as we can fit. So instead of a lot of you know, traditional PDA design has been, let's fit as much as we can on the screen because we have these young power users, we had to take a step back and think, how can we design for this p particular population? Something else that we found, we tried a couple of different barcode scanners, and one that we thought was going to be really popular, it was a little pen that you just kind of wipe over the barcode. It turns out it wasn't very usable at all for a couple of reasons, one being that you were trying to hold the food item, the pen, and you had your PDA somewhere, and it was just, you know, without three hands, that was kind of difficult to do. And another reason is the version that we used back then um, of the scanner didn't have any kind of visual or auditory um, uh, indication that you were actually successful in scanning and that was a big drawback. So instead we used the, the barcode scanner that you plug into the top of the PDA that's made by Socket. Um, so, so once we knew that they could actually use the PDA, we, something that we found out in the study was we, we actually performed that study with healthy young people, healthy older people, and this particular population. And this was the only population that said, I don't need anything with barcodes. And they were, you know, we'd ask them what they ate, and sure enough, they did eat things that have barcodes, but they didn't recognize them. It wasn't part of their world um, in their perception. So we wanted to know if we actually gave them a device and had them take it home, would they be able to find and successfully scan these barcodes? And so that was the second study that we did, um, where we gave them the device for three weeks and had them scan everything that they were eating. And if they couldn't find a barcode, they would voice record what they were eating so we could come back later and train them where to look for the barcode. And we had some really interesting results. One of the things that the nurses were really afraid of was that this population would not return the devices because they thought they might sell them um, to get money because it's a very impoverished population. And as it turns out, they were more careful with the devices than any, any group of people I've ever worked with. They were very, uh, very careful to bring them back every single time. And it was a, a, a real pleasure working with them. Um, but. Uh, what we, what we discovered from this is that, yes, they actually could. With very minimal training, they could find the barcodes. They could scan them, no problem. And I think in, at the two-week mark, we had kind of our maximum how much they were scanning every day. And then all of a sudden, there was kind of a big drop. And what we found was they decided it was a little bit easier to voice record what they were eating than scanning. And so they quit scanning. Um, but when you listen to the audio recordings of what they were scan or, or what they were recording, it wasn't something that you could easily parse. It, it was, uh, you know, someone who couldn't read when they ate Lucky Charm cereal was saying, "Well, I had a bowl of cereal, and it's the one that had the box on it has a leprechaun on it." And that's not something that we're going to be able to come up with a voice recognition system anytime soon that can actually determine what that is so that they can have real-time feedback. 
Um, but they obviously did really like voice. So we decided for the next study to actually pursue, was this barcode scanning the way to go, or should we think about doing voice recording or audio rec voice recognition as the input mechanism, because they tended to like that. We had avoided that at first, because the nurses said that they were very sensitive about their disease and they wanted to avoid any technology that had the stigma of disease associated with it. So voice recording, if they were around someone else, would be very obvious what they were doing. So we had avoided that, but we thought we would pursue this um, for one study. So we did this voices ver voice structured voice versus scanning study. And um, uh, so for half the time they had a cell phone and they called into a, a number and they went through this menu and they recorded everything that they ate and the other t half of the time they had the scanning application but they didn't have a voice option in the scanning application this time and we were comparing how much they were actually and what kinds of things they were actually recording with both mechanisms. What we found here um, was very mixed results and at this point we really could have gone either way th with the design. Um, they actually said they preferred the voice recording, uh, but as it turns out, they were actually less successful at voice recording and the kind of detail that we needed to actually give them real-time feedback. Um, what, the reason it turns out that they really liked the voice recording was because they liked the form factor of a phone. They liked having a cell phone on them, whereas the PDA was a bit larger and bulkier. Uh, but with the scanning, they were recording more things, they were recording more detail about what they were eating, and, f and far less detail and even success in getting the voice uh, recognition software to work with, with the cell phone. So we decided to continue with the scanning um, and, and the PDA solution because it also allowed them to have that real-time feedback every time they turned on the PDA, whereas with the cell phone, we would give them the feedback over the phone, but then they'd have to call up if they forgot what their values were. So we decided to stick with the PDA, although we might have been able to make uh, either, gone either direction there. So the last study is, we've been talking a lot about the scanning. Well, not everything has a barcode. And this is probably the more complicated of, of the design process. What do we want to actually do if they need to find icons? How do, we, how do we structure it in such a way they can find the icon easily enough that they're willing to do it? Because they have very limited amount of icons that can fit on the screen. So we did two two studies, and the first one we were looking at just high level kind of navigation. Um, w do they like to organize things in terms of time of day or food groups or some other way? And we also looked at the feedback icons, you know, what feed, we, we gave them a, a number of different kinds of feedback icons. What could they interpret correctly in terms of where they were in their daily lim uh, consumption? And um, the most interesting thing that we found out of this study, I mean, it did help us with the kind of high level navigation. But w with the feedback icons, we found that they actually preferred icons that they did not interpret correctly. And so we couldn't use those icons, obviously. It wouldn't be useful if they couldn't understand where they were in their daily limits. Um, but if we had just kind of stopped at what is your preference, we would have picked something that was really uh, very bad for this particular population. So we ended up using an icon that they could interpret correctly, even though it wasn't a pre preference. And then the last study we did was more how do you do the navigation so that it's not too complex and they don't get lost. And we tried a variety of things, everywhere from you have tabs, maybe a, a tab for each food group, all the way to you have back and forward arrow, arrows. So if you accidentally tap on the right, right icon, you can go back up uh, to the previous page and then, and then follow it um, to very linear, where you had to just keep going down the step, and if you got lost, press home and start at the beginning. And it turns out that last one is the way that we went with, because the other two were really complicated and they got lost and confused about where they were. So, so as it stands now for, the, for edema, you, you're basically building a meal. You say you're going to want to either scan a barcode or select an icon, and then if you're in the icon interface, you work your way down until you find your food. So you might pick, okay, grocery store items or fast food. If you're in the grocery, it's a fruit, it's a red fruit. Uh, now there's my red fruit. And if you, if you accidentally pick the wrong thing, you have to press home and start at the beginning. And this was uh, the one that, that people got lost the least and confused the least. 
they got very confused with the back button, where they were and what they were doing. And part of it is, so for fruits and vegetables, you could pick fruits, you could pick vegetables. We then went with color after that. Is it a green fruit? Is it a red fruit? And if they, they got confused, am I in the fruits, am I in the vegetables? And it really was difficult for them to actually complete the tasks when we had the back button. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Question? Yeah, could you tailor um, the items that you put, that you made available that they could select for your particular demographic? So, so, so what, what we, we did is, we, and yes, we did. Uh, the question was, did, I ta did we tailor the items for this particular demographic? We have soul foods, for example, and because we're dealing with a large African-American population. Um, we had done several studies where we were rec recording everything they ate over an extended period of time. Every food that was ever mentioned is available in this icon interface. Um, and then we have the, an easy ability to add. Um, I'm about to talk about a study we're about to do, and if, if, if a new food pops up, we can have that rolled in by the next time that, that we see them. So just some emergent themes uh, that came from one or more of these studies. The first one is when you're talking about giving technology to everyday people, it's really important that you integrate into their daily routines. And uh, as an example of this, you know, we originally thought we were going to have one device. It was portable, so they could use it at home. They could use it when they're, when they're out of the house. And it turns out patients either use it for one or the other. They don't tend to take it off the kitchen counter and then go out to eat and then come back and remember to put it on the kitchen counter. Um, not all, but a lot of them had, uh, had issues with this. So even though our current NIH grant doesn't provide funding for us to have two separate devices, that's kind of the future iteration is we're going to have something in the kitchen that stays on the counter and then the portable device. And it's something that we didn't ex anticipate and it came out through these, these kinds of studies. Um, the, as I mentioned before, the nurses were really worried about the stigma of disease and they didn't want us giving them anything that would say, I'm sick. Well, as it turns out, this particular population is so sick that their entire life is defined by this disease. Everyone they know knows they're sick and, and they're completely overwhelmed by it. And giving them a piece of technology was actually the one bright, shiny moment that they had associated with this disease. And they really enjoy showing it off to other people. In fact, so much we have to re be really careful about data analysis because when we're going along looking at all these barcodes they're scanning and all of a sudden you have a session that has 30 barcodes that includes paper towels and bleach and everything else, you have to wonder, okay, maybe they're not eating this. Um, so, um, so, so actually we might want to utilize the fact that in some populations, in some situations, Technology as a status symbol is a good thing, and it might pr pr promote adoption. The domain experts did not always have it right. Um, you know, the, the technology as a status symbol is one example, but what the nurses think the patients are eating is really pretty wrong including the dietitians, what the dietitians think that the patients are eating. Uh, it's not what they're recording and it's not what they're telling us. Um, one of the major things when you have an illness that is so restrictive is you want to cheat and you don't want to tell your caregiver because you don't want to be nagged about it. And so you need to actually build these technologies so that the patient can reflect on what their actual behavior is without necessarily telling someone else what that is. So the nurses had, had in the beginning, wanted the next iteration of this application to be networked so they could get real-time notices of someone was drinking too much or eating too much potassium, and they could intervene right then and give them a call. I think if we did that, you'd find that this patient population would lie to the technology then, and they wouldn't be honest with themselves. Uh, they wouldn't be able to reflect and see that, oh, I am cheating more often than I thought I was, because they're not gonna, they don't want the nurses to know that. And I think that that's really important when you're talking about healthcare, building in this ability to, to cheat on whatever your regimen is. Okay, so that is kind of the, a wrap up of why I think that the user-centered iterative design is really important. We saw a lot of things that we wouldn't have gotten from the nurses if we hadn't really gone in there and worked uh, with this particular population. Um, oh, and we have the prototype now, and what we're about to do is we have an NIH-funded pilot study where we're gonna have six weeks. Uh, they're gonna be 20 patients actually using our application, another 20 in the control group where they are getting the technology, but it has something very minor about looking at your daily activities, no feedback or anything like that, because we want to make sure that giving them technology isn't what motivates them to change their behavior, but it's actually doing the, uh, the, the tracking. And, it, and if, this is pos if this is promising, then we're going to go forth with a clinical trial. And for me, if, if you guys are HCI researchers in the audience, this is really exciting. Having a study of 40 people 
little over six weeks with technology is a really big deal in this domain. And the clinical trial, we're talking about hundreds of patients. And so for me, this is just wonderful to be able to team up with a group of researchers who this is just normal. This is how you have to do research to have these kind of large studies. All right, so the next kind of uh, idea that I want to get behind um, for, you know, things that we do when we're looking at these kinds of health interventions is looking at the existing behavior theories that are out there. And Mary's going to know all of these really well since she's in psychology. Um, but uh, uh, there's a lot of existing literature out there about why people behave certain ways and how um, they behave changers uh, or change behaviors, sorry. And, um, and I think that it's really... Uh, uh, useful for technologists to understand what those theories are so they can think about their interventions in terms of those theories and maybe target them more specifically for what they're trying to do. Um, so this is a really famous one in the health information um, uh, area. It's uh, Bandura's social cog cognitive theory. There are many kind of versions of this. This is our interpretation. Um, and some of the kind of key constructs that come out are things like self-efficacy. Uh, people have to feel confident that they can actually do a certain behavior in order for them to, to do it. Otherwise, they won't even try. You have behavior capability. So this is having the skills to actually achieve whatever behavior you're wanting. So in the case of Dima, we were really affecting this behavior capability by giving them a tool that allowed them to adhere to their diet, whereas before they had no idea what they were doing with respect to their diet. And that, in turn, can, can, can um, help their self-efficacy. And then you have a lot of other things, including social persuasion. So, you know, your social context really has an impact on, on what you're doing. And in fact, there's a, kind of a recent study out there where they were looking at overweight and obesity and they were looking at the social networks. And if you have a lot of friends that are obese, you're more likely to be obese. So social networking, uh, your social networks actually have a very significant impact on your health behaviors. And then also, of course, reinforcement. You know, if, you're, if you see changes or if you're congratulated for achieving a behavior, you're more likely to continue. So this is one of them. Um, another one that I really like is the trans-theoretical model, and it's the, it looks at the stages of change. And you go all the way from pre-contemplation, where you, it's not even on your radar, you're not thinking about change, to, okay, now you're thinking about change and contemplation, you're, you're thinking maybe you want to do it, preparation, you've decided you want to change your behavior, you start planning it, action, you're actually changing your behavior, and then maintenance and termination. And the thing with the stages of change model is that you move back and forth between stages all of the time. And what you want to think about with a technology intervention, perhaps, is maybe you want to target one or two stages, maybe the contemplation and preparation, and see if you can move people to the next stage. That would be a success. So it's not necessarily saying anyone who is in this, this population, I want to give them this intervention and I want to see that they actually maintain a, a, this positive behavior change. Instead, with your user studies, perhaps you want to say, I want to look at people who are thinking about making this change and see if I can get them to the action stage. And that would be a success. And I think that a lot of times researchers just open it up to anyone who's of a certain age. And, and, and so the results are very mixed because you're going to have um, people who are at different stages here. Um, so, so there are other models as well. Those are just two that I particularly enjoy. And so I'm going to kind of illustrate this with this, um, this second project, which looks at physical activity. So JFK gave this quote many years ago, and um, talking about how we're under-exercised as a nation, and some of the older people in the, in the room probably remember he had this president's physical fitness thing in the elementary schools. I remember receiving my certificate, um, really trying to encourage us to be more active in our youth. Well, the situation's a lot worse than when JFK was around. Um, in the past 20 years, the rate of obesity in adolescents has tripled. So we're worse off than we were back then, and it is due most likely to reasons that you could guess. Inactivity, so we're not being physically active, we're sitting on our bums a lot and driving in our cars, and poor dietary habits. We're eating a lot of junk food and fast food and things like that. So this particular project is focusing on teenage girls. It was actually a part of the student uh, design uh, Kai student design competition a few years ago, and I was the, one of the faculty advisors for it. And the the team chose the teenage girls for these three reasons. Um, girls tend to become more inactive than boys in adolescence because boys are still encouraged to do sports, whereas girls tend not to be. You want to be girly. 
They also turn to more um, unhealthy weight control me methods such as anorexia and bulimia. So this has significant health impact um, for now and for in the future. But as it turns out, some studies have shown they're also more re receptive to, um, to interventions at this stage for changing their behavior. And so it's really an ideal population to look at. They kind of have the worst possible implications, but they, they're receptive to, to, to changing. So, so they decided to look at this. And they came up with this project called Chick Click, and they got the name from the actual user population. They didn't come up with it themselves. Uh, and they won the competition that year, and we, we then proceeded to implement it and do a user study that was in Pervasive Health earlier this year. And uh, they, they did a couple things that are grounded in that Bandura's model of behavior change that I had in that first slide. The first thing is they wanted to model positive behavior. So they wanted girls who maybe weren't being as physically active to see other girls who were being more physically active so they could see that, well, if, if, if my friend could do it, then maybe I could do it too. They also wanted to include a lot of social support. And so they had this clique of girls, so that they would have up to four girls doing this application together. So it was utilizing their existing social networks and trying to have this social support. Um, and, then, uh, and then they also had this verbal persuasion. It was actually text messaging, so not verbal, but they had a way for girls to give each other feedback and really encourage each other. The idea behind it is that the girls would have two devices with them. They would wear a pedometer all the time, and they would have a cell phone, and the cell phone was running the Chick Click app application. Periodically throughout the day, the girls would enter the step count that they had, and it would automatically be sent to their friends' phones, and then they, you could see how much the other girls had, had entered that day. Um, and you could look at your current group process, so progress. So here, Aditi entered a thousand steps. Maybe you know, early in the morning, she went out and took a morning walk. Um, and yesterday, she hadn't walked much at all. She had gotten beaten by her friends. So you can see kind of progress over time. Um, and, and so this is how we, we're utilizing that social network. In addition, you have, we built in text messaging into the application so you could easily, when after you had looked at group progress, may, maybe you would go and you would send a message to either the entire group or a subset of the group, encouraging them in some way. So for our user study that we reported on earlier this year, we actually recorded all of the text messages that the girls sent to each other, not just within this application, because we wanted to see how the texting with, about physical activity might differ from the other, their other texting as well. So I, I don't have time to go into a lot of the results, but here are just a few things that we discovered. And the first is we, the girls really didn't know how to talk about physical activity in a positive way. They didn't say anything negative, but they just didn't know what to do and they felt kind of silly about it. And so we needed to incorporate some sort of scaffolding that wasn't there to help them formulate, here's a good kind of message that you might want to send. So perhaps some templates. Um, all of the girls thought had a very positive experience, um, but they could see how this could become negative in some situations, especially if it was done over a long time and people got super competitive. They thought that that could actually have a negative impact on self-esteem in the future. And so you need to be careful about that. And so if this was part of like a program that you would have in your gym classes or something, you would want to think about having kind of short targeted interventions that were somehow supervised by, by the, the instructor so that you could make sure that it remained a positive experience uh, for everyone. Um, another thing that we might be able to do, instead of having direct comparisons, you know, Richie had 6,000 steps today and I had 10,000, I beat you, ha ha, you know, we could show comparisons in terms of your own personal goal, you know, so I am, you know, three quarters of the way to my goal, so is Richie, we're equal here. And so we can be positive in encouraging each other to reach our goals, even if those goals aren't the same. Um, reciprocity is really necessary when you're relying on social support. We had one group of girls, there were three girls, one of them essentially didn't participate and the other two eventually dropped out too because they just didn't feel like they were getting the same thing from the, the third participant. And so you either need to build in a, a way for this kind of a game to prompt the users who aren't participating or think about how can you keep the other people participating even if one of the people drops out. Um, 
And finally, it was really critical to have a self-selected small group of friends. When we talked about, you know, would you want to do this with the entire class? No way would they want to do this with the entire class. Would you want to do it if you just kind of had some random people assigned? No, this is way too sensitive. And so they wanted to choose other, you know, their girlfriends who they felt would be supportive. Um, in fact, when we were looking at the text messaging in general from the girls that weren't related to this application, they were incredibly supportive. They were talking to each other about their boyfriends and their parents and all of these other things. They didn't necessarily know how to talk about physical activity, but they were really supportive of each other and their other, other um, uh, life uh, situations. And so I think that that was, was an important part of the application, to let them choose who was in the group with them. Um, so that's the second kind of big thing. We talked about iterative design process. We talked about grounded in some behavior theories. The last big thing that I think is really critical in most UBComp applications, but especially in healthcare, is having these in situ evaluation. If you just show people something and get their reaction, that's telling you that's telling you something about their attitudes about maybe whether or not they go to the store and buy it, but it's not telling you anything about their experience and how they're going to experience it. And I really um, advocate strongly for this. Another thing is a lot of times people are very excited about an, a technology, but as soon as that wow factor drops off, they stop using it. And so you want to see if you can actually integrate it into their normal life processes so that they would actually keep it up. Um, maybe if they don't, perhaps like, DEMA, perhaps it's just too hard to actually record all the time. We actually had a lot of participants telling us so far that this would have been perfect when they were first diagnosed to help them stabilize their diet. Or maybe once a year they would want to use it for two weeks to kind of reflect and stabilize. But it might not be something that's appropriate to have every day 24-7. So this last um, project that I'm going to talk about is actually looking at elders um, and technologies in the homes of elders to help them maintain their independence. Um, how are we doing on time? Is it? Okay. Um, and uh, one of the things that a lot of people look at with elders is look at physical safety and physical health. But I think that this quote kind of illustrates our philosophy at Indiana University, where your cognitive well-being and your social well-being are just as important because they have very dramatic impacts on your physical health as well. So we want to look at kind of the whole picture, not just the, the physical health. And the project is called Ethos. It stands for uh, Ethical Technologies in the Homes of Seniors. And um, it's really motivated by this demographic change that I talked about in the beginning with the boomers um, retiring. We're basically uh, having a much larger percentage of our population uh, is going to be elders by the year 2030. Uh, in fact, if you look at people 85 or over, that's the fastest growing demographic in the country. So, um, uh, and if you, I, I just heard a recent statistic, although I don't have a citation for it yet, I'm trying to get it. If you reach the age of 80, you're more likely to live 10 more years than you were in the previous decade. So if you reach that, you're, you're, you're pretty healthy and you're gonna, gonna be around for a while. And so because of this, you know, we're about to overload the infrastructure for caring for elders. Um, technology holds a great promise for helping us deal with this, with this problem. And a lot of people are starting to look at how technology can keep people in the home longer as well as help in assisted living facilities and things like that. Um, a recent number I heard was that it costs on the order of $10,000 a week if you uh, take someone and put them in an assisted living facility as compared to if they stay in their home. So there's a few, huge financial incentive to start looking at this area. One of the things that we've seen, especially as re, you know, in the last five years, is when technologists are looking at this issue, they completely punt on the issue of privacy. Um, I, I, you know, I've seen quoted in papers when they try to address privacy issues, they'll say things like, well, either the, the older person is going to give up all of their privacy because they're moving to assisted living, or they can give up some to the technology. Which would you choose? Okay, that was in a... Uh, Oh, uh, I, I can, I'll go and look. I was in a Spectrum article, um, IEEE Spectrum. And so, uh, so they're basically saying, you know, they don't have a choice. Uh, I think this is a really bad way to frame the, the, the issue uh, for a number of reasons. One is many of these technologies are being designed specifically to help 
loved ones decide when an elder needs to go into an assisted living facility, helping to make that choice. So they're looking for trends over a long period of time. So by def definition, we're asking elders to take these technologies into their homes before they're being forced to that decision. So, so we have to start thinking about the ethics involved in these technologies or, you know, if they're still independently living, they can refuse to have them completely. Um, so, so we shouldn't punt on the issue. A another thing that's a little more selfish is if you look at any kind of technology like this that maybe starts for one target population, it bleeds out into the rest of the population. So we need to be thinking about these issues from the beginning. So as it turns out, if you look in the academic literature, there are a whole lot of ways to think about privacy, and here's just four of them. And I don't even have my head around all of them. I'm not the privacy expert that's on this uh, particular project. But you have everything from some seclusion, which is the right to be left alone, other people can just go away and leave you alone, to autonomy, the right to do what you want. Autonomy is a real big one with elders just in general because they don't want to give up control over their own lives. Um, to property, and this is the legal reality we live under, whoever collects the data owns it and can use it pretty much whatever way they want. It's a very different model than you would have, say, in Europe. Um, to spatial things, and this is really pertinent if you're talking about things in the home. You know, you might be perfectly comfortable with a certain technology in your living room, but you're very uncomfortable having it in your bedroom or in your bathroom. So different spaces might have different privacy expectations. The problem when you kind of look at all of these different paradigms is that neither designers who are designing these technologies or elders who are using them, the consumers of them, really understand them all that well. You know, a few might, but in general they don't because it's not something that we, we, we think about every day. And so if you sit down a designer and an elder and you say, let's design something that is sensitive to your privacy needs, it's really a challenge because we, we don't really have a good way to communicate with each other about these and we're, we're not all well versed in, in what the various implications are. So what we're doing in the Ethos project, the main goal here is to develop this toolkit, which is in year two. We just finished year one. We're starting year two. And it's basically a way to enhance this communication between the designer and the elders and their loved ones. So we have a participant evaluation tool where the goal is to take them through a series of questions, finding out what do they care about, what are they sensitive to, um, who would they be willing to share this information with, but you just can't come out and say it that way. Um, if you you know, paint a scary scenario and say, do you care about privacy? Everyone's gonna say, yeah, I do. But if you actually try to walk them through, well, you know, do you mind having this in the bedroom? That might be very different than, than um, you might get very different answers. So we have to construct this using the language that elders would use and trying to think about how they actually think about privacy and what terms they use. Um, and then we'll also have this designer tool, which the designer will use as they're actually putting in different devices into the home. It can actually flag them if something violates uh, a concern that the participant actually indicated in the previous tool. Um, so it can ha assist designers in, in designing something that is sensitive to that particular person's needs because everyone is different, let me tell you. And then finally, we have this library which makes it really easy to implement. Uh, basically, it can you know, obscure timestamps, aggregate data, and things like that to make sure that you're not just monitor, you know, tracking every single possible thing. You're, tr you're, you're gathering the information that is important for your design um, and, and so it's not going to be reused perhaps in a way that you didn't expect it to at a later point. Um, and so what we've done this first year is we set up a living lab and that is uh, a picture of it and it's basically just a one bedroom apartment. The idea is not to bring elders in to live there but it's to contextualize the prototypes that we're, we want to talk to them about so that they can try to get a better sense for how these technologies might be embedded in their own homes. Um, and it's just an intermediate step. Um, and, and then we, we, do a lot, we, we did a lot of focus groups where we're trying to understand how elders talk about privacy without actually bringing up the term privacy ourselves. So, you know, they came in for these focus groups and we would ask them things about usability and need and where would you put this, but we didn't mention privacy until the very end then to make sure that we actually covered everything that we needed. Um, so we've done that. Uh, and, it, and again, it's more to understand how they think about privacy, not to come up with a one-size-fits-all privacy solution. And then that's going to build into this toolkit. And then in year three, we're going to be doing this longitudinal study. 
It's going to be at least six weeks, and hopefully if we can afford more, it will be longer. But we're going to have four families, and they live in a retirement community in Bloomington. We're working with the retirement community, and we're going to have four groups of student designers designing for these families. And one, two of the groups are going to be using this toolkit, and two of them are not. And we're going to be able to then try to do an evaluation on, you know, how were the privacy needs or concerns actually addressed in, in, in the designs based on using this toolkit? Was it used? useful or not. So I'll talk just briefly about a couple of the prototypes that we're looking at. In the focus groups, we actually used things that were off the shelf too. We had like this big honking medicine reminder that's really ugly and we used that and we also developed our own prototypes because we wanted to get away from just, you know, uh, medicine adherence and, and, and physical safety. We wanted to look at some other aspects because there are different kinds of data and different uses of the data if you start looking at, say, social um, applications. So we designed some of these. And Richie Hazelwood's in the audience here. He's had a heavy hand in a, in a lot of what I'm talking about right now. Um, so this first one is the ambient plant pot. And you see that there are two pots in these pictures, one on uh, the left side of each of them. And the idea is that they simply have a motion detector on them. And if you walk by one of the plot, pots in one home, the other one is going to slowly flash this kind of deep blue color. So you can see that, that someone is by their pot at the other end, basically. Um, and, and the idea is just to give people a feel for kind of the daily routines that people are undergoing. So in this case, we actually deployed it. And there was a sunroom here, and the, the older couple kept the pot in the sunroom, and they spend a lot of time there. And their daughter kept it in her own home office. And one thing that we found in the focus groups, almost universally, this concept was disliked. Nobody could get their head around why you would want to have this. Um, and in fact, the participants who participated in this study, they thought the same thing at the beginning of the study. They looked at this and they're like, you know, we're really uncertain about it. But by the end of the study, they didn't want to give it back to us. They, they, it, they had to experience it before they could actually understand how it could be useful because it wasn't filling an immediate need that they saw, but they would be sitting in their sunroom and the plant pot would go off and they'd be like, oh, you know, Lisa's working at home today. That's so nice. And they just didn't realize how nice of a connection that would be to kind of see the daily rhythms of their loved one's household. Um, and so it was, it, the attitudes really changed after experiencing it. And I think that you see this a lot in, in UBComp in general. This second one, I don't have a good picture of because it's actually implemented in a mirror and you know how difficult it is to take a picture of a mirror without just seeing your own reflection. So I, I, I put up one of the initial sketches which, which isn't exactly what it looks like now. Um, but it's the mirror motive and it's basically having some sort of a reminder system embedded in an everyday object. So a lot of people have mirrors in their home and they chose the mirror to do this. Um, and it, it, so the final one doesn't look like this, but basically when you come up to the mirror, a motion sensor can detect that you're there, a proximity sensor. And then it, if you, uh, it might ask you, have you measured your blood sugar today? And you just kind of wave to just your interaction, yes or no. Um, or it might ask you if you've taken your medications, or it could even ask you, you know, if your daughter, your daughter could submit an invitation and it could say, Johnny has a soccer game tomorrow. Do you want to go with them? Yes or no? Those kinds of things. So it has a little bit of monitoring because it can kind of, it can tell your, your responses to maybe medication adherence. Um, but, but it's mostly just a reminder system. And what we found interesting in the focus groups, we haven't actually deployed this one, is that people just inherently trusted the system. They didn't really worry where the data was going or what people were doing with it. So privacy just wasn't even on their radar when they talked about this particular system. Uh, when they talked about the ambient plant, privacy did come up a, a fair amount. So this last one is the portal monitor. And it, it, there are actually a few different uses of this. It's basically having cameras around the door. And the, the first one that you see here is anytime someone rings the doorbell, three quick snapshots are taken and it's sent via the cell phone to whoever you designate. So it could be your daughter or your son. And, and the idea here is a lot of elders are, fall prey to people who are trying to scam them. And your, your son or daughter could just see, oh, you know, I recognize this person, that's fine. You know, it's, it's 
my it's my dad's friend Joe. He came to visit, or you could see some construction like looking guy who's trying to sell him a new roof, and you can you know give him a call or call a neighbor up and and help protect against that kind of uh, predatory. Um, uh, behavior. Uh, another way that this can be used, we actually have a camera pointing from the outside and from the inside, and every time the door opens, the snapshots are taken and sent to the cell phone. And this can help prevent wandering if, you're, if your parent is starting to lose it a little bit cognitively, and then all of a sudden you see your mom is walking out in the middle of winter without her coat, then maybe that would give you cause to concern to call someone who's nearby. Um, and people, uh, the, the people in the focus groups, really, really liked this particular idea because it focused on the physical, physical security. And, and it was a need that they could immediately relate to. They had all these horror stories of you know, people being taken advantage of or people going out um, and wandering. And so they could really relate to this one. And because of that, they were really comfortable with the fact that there were pictures or even video being taken um, at the door. They were fine with that. But things like the ambient plant, not all of them, but several of them were very concerned that, well, that's kind of like Big Brother, somebody knowing that I'm walking in my kitchen now. And so even though it's motion, it's a very low signal, you know, they were uncomfortable with that, whereas a complete picture uh, was perfectly fine for them. And so I think that that just kind of illustrates how you have to contextualize the kind of data and what it's being used for, for people to really uh, be able to react appropriately. You can't just say video. You can't just say pictures. You have to understand what the use is for. Um, Okay, so just some initial results because we're just now transcribing the focus groups and we haven't done the data analysis. But unlike the chick click application where reciprocity was really important, here it actually made elders uncomfortable. They, you know, they didn't mind necessarily having the plant, pl the plant pot in their house. They might not understand why it was used, but they're like, okay, it can be there. But they felt like it was an intrusion of their daughters privacy to ask her to put it in her house and so that they could see. And so we had thought that reciprocity would be really important to, to encourage them to adopt if they could see their kids and not just be the ones being monitored. That would be, make it more acceptable. But that's not necessarily the case. They felt like they were intruding. Data as property, even though it's the legal system in, under which they live, it's kind of a foreign concept. They really didn't talk about it in terms of property. They talked about privacy in, in, in other terms. Um, so that's just interesting in and of itself because because it's uh, you know the legal reality is very different than than what they they think about, um, and that the data granularity is not the deciding factor. You know how much information is being given is not the deciding factor here. It's how it's being used and and the utility that is giving in between uh, in response. You know physical security falling down. These are concerns that they really have and they're willing to give up a lot for that. Um, actually, they might not necessarily be willing to give up a lot, but their friends would. And that's something else you find a lot with elders. They do not visualize themselves as being older and needing these kinds of technologies, but they all have friends who could use something like this. Um, and then finally, just longitudinal in situ studies give you very different results than if you just bring them in and ask them a bunch of questions. Um, I just wanted to put up real quick the other faculty who are on this just to show you the kinds of um, collaborations you need to have to be able to do a, t a project like this. You know, we have Jean Camp, who is our expert on privacy. Um, Lisa Huber, she is a specialist with elders and have been, has been working with them for a long time. And then we have a social scientist who's really looking at our methods as well. So, so those are the, the kind of the, the human-centered approach that we're taking at IU. We have this you know, iterative, uh, human-centered design process. We ground it in behavior theories whenever we can. We do a lot of in-situ longitudinal testing, which is very expensive, but well worth it. And then in, this, in ethos in particular, we're really looking at the methods of how to elicit these privacy concerns, because you just can't ask the questions. So the thing I want to announce is that is really exciting to me is we have this really large security group in, in, at Indiana University, and they're all listed here. Everyone from a lawyer here to Jean, I mentioned, is the private, privacy specialist, a cryptographer, network specialist, trusted computing, etc. And we've recently all gotten on board to look at pervasive health applications. And we've gotten funding from the Lilly Endowment to have this new institute. In fact, Dennis was integral in getting this funding, and then he left us. 
Um, but we're going to be focusing our security and privacy work on this particular application domain. And I think that that's really exciting because you don't see a lot of people out there doing that. And in hopefully in the spring, but perhaps next fall, we're going to host a workshop, kind of like a Grand Research Challenges workshop, um, where we're going to bring uh, leading researchers around the country both on the technology side, on the privacy and security side, and the healthcare side. We're going to bring them all together, try to identify what are the major challenges that we need to be looking at over the next 10 years if we're hoping these technologies are really going to be pervasive and helping us with our healthcare. Um, and, and, and I hope that'll help define kind of some of the research agenda uh, in the future. So look for that next year. If you're interested in this, definitely uh, get in contact with me. We'll be having a solicitation for basically a short proposal on why you would want to attend the conference and what you would have to, to, to add to it because we want to issue, uh, issue this report that will have a, a big impact. So that's my talk. Any questions? Questions? Mm -hmm. I came in late, so if you've already covered that, mm -hmm. I apologize. But did, did you also look at sensors that detect impact? So when people actually fall? Oh, when they fall. And, uh, for, uh, for the, the airbags in the cars. Right. Like so we have not done that, although I think that it's a very interesting area. The, the focus in the Ethos project was really to try to come up with a variety of types of applications that address different, like social, physical, uh, different uh, needs just to facilitate the conversation. The end really was not in the prototypes themselves, but it was in what, what is it that makes this data gathering acceptable to you where something else might not? Um, so we ended up talking a lot about fall detection because that was a need that a lot of people saw. Um, and so even though we didn't have a prototype for it, there's a lot of conversation in there about fall detection. And in fact, the plant pot, people kept trying to turn it into something that would de detect if you had fallen. Because if, well, if I didn't walk into the kitchen, then my daughter would see, and, and then she would call me and discover that I had fallen and I won't be left there for 24 hours. So they, even though it's not designed for that and it wouldn't be very good for that, they turned it into that a lot. Because actually, the fall detection problem mm -hmm. is a very complicated problem. So yes. Folks in Berkeley have been at it for many, many years. It's very right. hard. I, I also found your sort of uh, sending photos on the cell phone concept quite powerful. And which which one? Send, sending photos. Oh yes. You know, taken out uh -huh. the, the door to the cell phone very powerful. Have you, have you, are you familiar with the sense cam? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, Gizmo that we have. I mean, right. And, and that's also the main idea there that you're taking photos. Uh, right. At interesting times and beaming the data out. I think. The, the reason this was actually acceptable to the people we showed it to was that it was such a targeted location that they felt it was okay. They really did not want pictures and video in the rest of the house because they didn't want to feel like they had to do their hair every time they walked through the living room, that kind of thing. But at the door, they could see why it would be useful and they didn't go to the door unless they were going to see someone else anyway. And so that was okay. And so the sense cam, I think, I, I mean, it's a fascinating project, but I don't know how comfortable elders would be with that um, just because they, they want to know and they want to have it targeted at a location where they don't feel like they're, they're, they're having their picture taken when they're not expecting it. It works really well for memory problems. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, could, I could understand that. that. Yeah. One last observation. Uh -huh. Given your experiment with putting cameras on the door, I'm sure you're aware that security companies like EDTs are mm -hmm. very interested in expanding yeah. into this space. Right. They want to provide healthcare monitoring and sort of mm -hmm. healthcare monitoring services. And, and I think that that's going to be really popular in the future. Even though uh, a person might not want their daughter seeing something, almost universally, they had no problem with an ADT having that information. Or an ADT, if there was video monitoring and it was an ADT person who was watching it to, to see if they had fallen, that was okay compared to maybe the video showing up on their daughter's you know, desktop in a little frame or something. They didn't like that or, or their friend seeing it. But an ADT, that's a service you're paying for and they saw the value of that and, and they liked that. But, but again, I have to say, in general, people could see someone else using it. They have a very hard time thinking that they're going to need that and buy it. Um, you know, you have those buttons where you if you fall, you press it and, it and it sends an alert. Even people who had fallen in our focus groups didn't think that they needed it yet. 
and it, it was always someone else. And so you, you have that barrier that people don't see themselves as aging. So actually getting them to use the technology um, or purchase the technology might be difficult. Yeah, Andrea. Yeah. Um, do you, so talking about the, the same, the, the photo taking uh -huh. thing again, um, do you think that the, the children who are receiving the pictures need any sort of scaffolding for in, either interpreting or sifting through all these pictures? Because is it like all day they're, they're potentially getting well, so it's every time either someone rings the doorbell, if it's that version, or if someone opens the door. And so um, it, it, in some ways, if you have someone who is very active and always going in and out, that, that door opening one isn't going to be appropriate for them, right? Because they're going to have so many pictures that they're not going to, 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 to know what to do. Um, but the doorbell one, most people don't have a lot of people ringing their doorbells, so, so that would make more sense. And it tends to be, I think, the people who would use the technology more are people who are becoming less capable of going out a lot more. Um, you know, they might be starting to early stage Alzheimer's or something like that. Um, and, and so it, it really becomes, I mean, it's the, it's the same thing as any kind of intrusion detection system, right? The false positives can make it so it's not very useful and you have to, you have to gauge that. And I think it's going to be on an individual situation. I don't know what kind of scaffolding we can do. Um, this is actually uh, Gene Camp's project more than mine, um, but that's an interesting question. I, I, is there a way to support it beyond just showing them pictures? Can we do any kind of processing to help them gauge what's actually going on would be interesting. Thanks. Other questions? Dennis. So do you ever think about how your, uh, the elders, for example, uh, not really growing up with the technology and you derive a lot of conclusions. Do you ever speculate about, all right, we've got people now, the kids that are you know, born texting mm -hmm. instantly, how they will Will any of your conclusions likely change? Absolutely. Um, it's something that we struggle with a lot because the current cohort of elders, you're right, they're not as technology savvy as the ones who are about to retire. So something that we've done is we're actually working with a retirement community that are early adopters, essentially. They are technology savvy and they're more reflective of the majority of elders that are coming up. Um, but that doesn't necessarily reflect the entire population, and we recognize that. It's kind of the low-hanging fruit, the easy population to target right now. So the next iteration of what we're looking at, uh, um, uh, looking for funding for right now, is to start looking at the other side of the digital divide. And um, we're actually going to start looking at urban centers and um, uh, people who have different community settings even. You know, maybe their kids don't move away, and so they're not as, uh, as far away from the children as, as the ones where we're looking at now um, and they have different technology experiences as well but you're absolutely right different cohorts they're going to have different exper life experiences and that is going to impact how they think about the technology and how they use the technology and it's something we just have to try to account for but until you until until you get old enough to use it we're not going to know you know other questions all right thank you thank you